Hello everyone, greetings from the 7th of Nero, Asia here with a continuation of the series on soldiery. This time is the mechanical troops of the conversions of Cyrus, though at the time of publication, with what's on the horizon regarding the game of War Machine, it remains to be seen how the faction will evolve going into Mark IV. For that reason, the ending is necessarily coy, shall we say, touching on content first seen in the IK RPG Requiem call book. Nevertheless, there's enough material to be working with for the time being to cover the faction in some measure of detail and still have a fair bit to spare for those who wish to read it for themselves. As with other such presentations, based on the narrator's viewpoint, some aspects will come across as a touch confused or detached, or even wrong, but still not unsympathetic, as befits a seeker's outlook, due to the predominantly human membership of the Convergence and its secretive origins and practices. To be clear, Cyrusists are more than just the Convergence, just that this particular sect within the cult is perhaps, simultaneously, the most zealous and the most secretive, at least in the matters which pertain to the continuation of worship of the so-called Maiden of Gears and military defence. The latter is viewed as necessary since there are numerous sites and facilities which the Convergence consider vital for their future survival, whether out of practicality or symbolism. Were one to be a follower of the Nine Harmonics, such a viewpoint is easy to appreciate. That said, their secrecy has diminished somewhat in recent years, thanks to the innumerable events which framed the battle at Henchhold. But even so, for the greater part of the Convergence's existence, secrecy was not so much necessary as mandatory. And it should come as no surprise that many among them remain furtive and suspicious of even the most benign scrutiny. But what makes the warriors of the Convergence different from those of other powers active in the Iron Kingdoms is a preponderance of clockwork vessels, mechanical bodies which house a cultist's soul. Though this does not necessarily apply to all, transference is nevertheless what all members of all temples aspire to. Transference was the product of the former divinity architect Father Lucan's work, a fundamentally arduous process which violently separates soul from body. All who loyally and diligently follow the Nine Harmonics can expect a clockwork vessel set aside for them, though whether it should come through merit or the death of their mortal body remains a matter for the Maiden of Gears, it would seem. That said, possession of a clockwork body does not necessarily dictate a cultist's responsibilities or seniority. Simply put, the ranks of the Convergence's warriors can be divided into three broad categories, the priesthood, the guardians, and the servitors and they are distinctly segregated from each other in military respects, for all have separate tactical functions on the battlefield with comparatively little apparent overlap. The first also encompasses the aspiring priesthood, since only the most adept and mechanically talented have a chance of joining the priesthood proper. Those lay members of the Convergence who assist the cults, priests, and contribute to the maintenance of their facilities are generally referred to as technicians. Even so, as a whole, Though priesthood in the context of the Convergence, including those who wish to attain a priestly rank, should not be interpreted in a conventional sense, for a priest of the Convergence is as much a student of mathematics and mechanica as an evangelist for their religion. Though all members of the cult consider transference to a clockwork body as the ultimate goal of their worldly ex existence, no few priests, particularly those of junior status, retain their bodies of flesh and blood, awaiting their time to gain immortality, after a fashion. In any event, Away from the temples, the priesthood serves as support on campaign, whether of the Convergence's warjacks, or of its troops, or of its warcasters. The vectors are maintained by the mechanics of the Optifex Directive. These most junior among the priesthood are trained specifically to know every last detail and me mechanism, which allows a vector to not only function, but to do so optimally. As such, they can affect battlefield repairs or make adjustments to them to better suit tactical requirements. Meanwhile, many units are accompanied into battle by a transverse enumerator who coordinates them making calculations about where and how her warriors may be most effective. Enumerators are the next step above Optifex in the Convergence's hierarchy, and are themselves answerable to the Fluxions, who rarely take to the battlefield owing to the importance of their responsibilities to the Temple. The Fluxions only answer to the Iron Mother. While transverse enumerators often are yet to undergo transference, many enumerators are nonetheless housed in clockwork bodies, such as the Enigma Foundries, who serve in a more traditional priestly role. They are nonetheless very mechanically adept as befits a senior priest, but they are more given to guiding and preserving their fellow Cyrusists, almost irrespective of context. And such guidance and preservation extends to the battlefield, where they can both repair the, d the damaged clockwork bodies of fallen soldiers, but also recover their essence chambers when the chassis are irrecoverable. Their presence on the battlefield is a strange paradox, of a pondering construct whose every gesture may be only be described as reverent, as they see to the mechanical bodies or essence chambers of the Convergence's soldiers. 
Most of said active soldiers on the field of battle are guardians, as those members of the cult are called, should they be not so inclined to the technical, and be better suited to wielding weapons and shields instead of tools and the arcane. Though those who serve the convergence well may expect to be rewarded with transference to an essence chamber which may be installed into a suitable chassis, many guardians of flesh and blood fall in battle, and, out of both necessity and pragmatism, they are granted transference to preserve them for continued service. Irrespective of such circumstances, such guardians must endure the process of learning how to acquire and maintain control over their new bodies. Over time, they become attuned to their chassis and many are able to be transferred to multiple bodies, so much so it is common for soldiers to have separate bodies for the battlefield and for their duties at their parent temple. The majority of these guardians are divided among two corps. The multiform mason chain armed obstructors who fight in serried ranks of a phalanx, and behind them are the reductors, equipped with weapons akin to a scattergun which uses spring-loaded mechanisms to shoot clockwork projectiles, which strike amidst an explosion of lacerating blades. It is not too uncommon for many guardians to have expertise in both branches of clockwork soldiery, and in times of need when a temple's ranks of one are depleted, its veterans can maintain a balance between the available numbers of each. This is particularly more prevalent among those guardians who have served long enough to earn their transference through battle honours instead of the death of their bodies. The longest serving of the reductors and obstructors as well as those who are the most well regarded among them, are given the singular honour of transference to the bodies of the elite reciprocators and perforators. Fielded in smaller units than their comrades, thanks to there being far fewer of them, these soldiers are equipped with the finest equipment mass produced by the Convergence's artificers. All of their weapons and shields are of an adaptable design, modular, so as to adjust as tactical circumstances require, as befits their skill at arms and service to the Convergence. But among such soldiers are a special battalion most of the eradicators, while the others are a logical evolution of service within the cult, particularly of their analogous junior corps. The eradicators represent the recognition of what transference can do to an individual. After several decades of combat service in a clockwork body, it is possible for the soul within to lose their sense of self. Consequently, it is one of the many duties of the priests to ensure this does not occur. Where the risk becomes apparent, where an an individual loses sight of the convergence's goals, those cultists have their essence chambers transferred to the uniquely equipped eradicator chassis, unlike the reciprocators who must fight with regimented actions shoulder to shoulder, and the perforators who must take care to shoot precisely to minimise risks to their peers. The eradicators are more warriors than soldiers. They are armed with the blade and buckler, and their weapon modes encourage this consideration of themselves over others, whether it is their ability to fight or their need for self-preservation. In this way, the heat of battle ensures their individuality can be retained no matter their service to the Cyrusist cause. Some, though, descend further, losing their humanity more than can be recovered by the priesthood. The fate of these unfortunate souls is unknown to all but the most senior among the Convergence's temple leadership. But not all of the veterans among the ranks of the Guardians go on to the elite branches of the Convergence's regular forces, however. Some, who are noteworthy for martial prowess as an individual, rather than as part of a formation, go on to attend the senior priests of a temple, whether as a bodyguard on the field of battle, or as a herald and aide when carrying out non-combat duties. These include the Steel Soul Protectors, who often spend long years practicing their craft of weapons mastery and protecting their charges as living guardians, surviving long enough to never require an involuntary transference. Those few who earn transference come to be permanently attached to a particular warcaster or high-ranking priest, thanks to the degree to which they are aware of their favoured tactics and methods. But while these two broad bodies of troops comprise the majority of the Convergence's battle forces, a small company was recently formed and expanded, under the command of Aurora, who was called the Numen of Aerogenesis at the time before her rise to the rank of Archnumen. Thanks to the technological advancements directly attributable to her, the Clockwork Angels came into being as a formidable skirmishing force, which takes advantage of their ability to fly, uninhibited by factors which do prevent true flight among many of the other powers of Amorin. They, and an elite cadre from within their ranks, the Negation Angels, form a somewhat detached part of the Convergence's forces, since their very recent formation meant their status within the hierarchy of the cult has not fully settled, for no few among the regular forces view them with a measure of disdain and even envy, given their direct subordinate position under a warcaster at least in the years before her departure from Cain. Thus, the muted rivalry which exists between the junior units of obstructors and reductors is a little more open between them and the angels. 
For the most part, however, it appears as though the priesthood stands above such seeming pettiness, and the rivalry itself has little impact upon the Convergence's military effectiveness. As to the last category, unlike the other troops available to the commanders of the Convergence, the servitors are entirely mechanical, with no indication of sapience or sentience. Though intricately designed and constructed and their usage carefully regulated, the numerous forms of servitors are nonetheless seen as expendable. Even so, their function and ability are invaluable parts of the Convergence's war efforts, filling the gaps left by the other soldiers of the sect in terms of tactical roles. The priests, technicians and guardians are, perhaps, ill-suited to such roles, which put their bodies, whether mechanical or of flesh, at too much risk. Instead, the servitor's narrow profile is more ideal for these functions, which require more stealth or unobtrusive support. Some, in particular the reflex servitors, can be placed, dormant as it were, for days or even weeks in a potential battlefield, awaiting the arrival of an unwitting enemy to be surgically destroyed in short order. In a similar vein, for each discrete purpose, there is a servitor allotted to carrying it out, whether it is skirmishing, utility support in battle, or even repairs alongside the Optifex directive. Other servitors are even more specialised, operating in direct conjunction with other elements of a Cyrusist force. If nothing else, it seems the servitor technology is exemplar, if at the simplest level, of convergence attitudes towards the mechanical, that they are tools and little else, and that independent thought belongs only to the living, hence the differences display between cortex and interface node. And this is in accordance with the seventh harmonic, which makes it against Cyrusist belief to construct what they describe as false sentience. But as with all nations and organisations, the claiming changed the convergence. Much of their leadership and membership departed through the gates to the sanctuary of another world far from Cain, far from Infernal Reach. And those refugees included many from the most senior of their number. And in the succeeding years, the united efforts to root out Infernalism also led to the widespread tolerance, if perhaps not quite acceptance, of the Saracist faith. Like everyone else, those of the Convergence have been compelled to adapt, perhaps more so than most humans at least, thanks to said loss and departure of so many with the unwelcome reappearance of the Orgoth in Cador, who are sure to turn their eyes southwards. Time will tell whether the Convergence will reform into a new Cyrusist militia, or let themselves be subsumed into the forces of a greater state.